Welcome to 2024. I don't know about you, but I had a really amazing time with artificial intelligence and using large language models in 2023. And I'm ready to take it to the next level. I've worked a lot with retrieval augmented generation. I played a lot with agents and done some of these GPTs. Now you can you got chat GPT and you can uh, even upload documents just through a clickable GUI or use the assistance API. Did, done a lot of dabbling, done a lot of discussing and planning and learning. And I've been able to do things I never even imagined I would be able to do with a time frame that would be feasible. And one thing that I've started dabbling in that I haven't really gotten very far in yet is these multi-agent workflows. And I think to me, this is the next level. I really have a goal for this year. I want to start looking at practical things that I need to do for my day-to-day -day life, for my day-to-day -day job. And I want to start getting AI to do part of those things all of those things. I want to take my CIC to pipelines. I want to take my automations. I want to find the hard parts and I want to slot in uh, artificial intelligence. And in some cases, maybe we'll have it do everything. Maybe it'll write some code for us, right? Other cases, maybe we'll take an automation and take some of those hard parts and, and uh, be able to take some of those out, some, of, some combination of scripting and coding with the language models. But now, multi-agent workflows, I think are really cool, right? Because we can go to the bots and we can say, hey, go write this complex code for me or go and, and read this novel or, or some something you know, more complicated than just a basic question. Uh, and th that that gets to be a difficult thing, right? The bot, some things that they're really trained well on, really expert on you know, writing text, it, you can have a conversation with the bot and, and get them to write some text for you pretty easily. But you start to want to do more complicated things and it gets hard. Now uh, you can go back to training models from the ground up, you can go into fine tuning and we're going to explore those, right? But I think those are a level of difficulty in terms of actually doing it. Uh, I think they are expensive, complex, and, and I think they're very good, but I think you want to get as much as you can out of this kind of prompt engineering and retrieval augmented generation. And, and then as you've got uh, as much as you can from those, uh, where you still have those hard problems. That's where we're going to come back in and, and solve those with fine tuning or additional training, right? Now, multi-agent workflows, you know, what's the deal there? Why is it different than just talking to ChatGPT or calling the open AI API or calling one of the other open source models? And I think the key difference is like about prompt engineering. You can do things like a example, give an actual example of what you want to accomplish um, in there. And that's works really well. If you can put what you want to accomplish in there. Think about, you want to know about a just some repo on GitHub, right? That's too much, way, way too much for the context windows. As I know some of the larger context windows like Claude, there's some challenges with the LLMs being able to really handle the large, huge context windows. So what if instead of me just asking the bot one complicated thing to do something with, with one prompt, what if I could make a bunch of these bots? And maybe I can make these bots uh, experts on uh, a variety of different things and maybe we can talk together. And that ties into another thing is like when you get into retrieval augmented generation, there's definitely an upper limit on the efficacy that you get from how large you, you make a single vector database. And uh, um, you can go ahead and play with routing and change the way you chunking and change the way you do a lot of different things. But you start to, to have declines in performance, if you say, here's one agent, and I'm going to give it this absolutely massive vector database with all types of different things and ask it complicated questions. And it's really interesting that the multi-agent thing is, a, is an interesting phenomenon about LL LLMs. Now, on one hand, if I think about making multiple agents, that helps me to use work together with the language models, right, to break down the problems I want to solve into smaller steps. And that's really useful for me as a human, right? It makes it easier for a human to conceptualize about it. But I think what's really interesting about multi-agent workflows is it's not just easier for us. It seems to be uh, easier for an LLM, which is really strange because think about all of these GPTs exist. If you go to one of these platforms like Poe or something that has just tons and tons and tons of bots, all of those bots they all are just calling the same open AI endpoint. So you're really getting the same exact LLM to pretend or, or play these roles um, that it is these multiple different things, but it isn't.
the framework and the way we go about it also allows us to, instead of having this concept of a single prompt, right? I've got lots and lots of different contexts, lots of different agents that each have their own prompts and I can organize them that way. And then so you can let them talk to each other. You can tie each of your different agents to a different prompt engineering, a different context, a different retrieval, a different vector database. I make them each responsible for expertise in a particular thing. So maybe you have a architecture project and you want to do code or operations for some complex projects, that, a stack that involves multiple things. If you try to make one agent and, and one kind of retrieval augmented setup knowledgeable across a, a large stack of different things, you, you may not get the best performance out of it, but you take the same the same data, you break it into a, a, these few different agents, which are you know, virtual entities, right? And and you say each of them are responsible for a certain part, and you use a framework to allow them to communicate with each other about it, right? Then you start to see just really powerful effects. Uh, the abilities for the agents, for, for the LLMs to know things and to do things, to use tools and to work together to accomplish goals starts to become really pronounced. And I think we're really at the tip of the iceberg. There's a lot of really cool projects that have demonstrated. Now we're seeing LLMs doing more than we were seeing them do three months ago, six months ago, um, solely through this type of technique without additional training, without fine tuning, without other more complex things. Right? And I think there's, as we get dive further into this paradigm, and we play more with these structures that I think there's a tremendous amount of more complex automations and tasks that we'll be able to do. So that is the multi-agents idea in a nutshell. Now, how do we do multi-agents? And it turns out your multi-agent is not especially difficult to do, right? Like you can use tools that maybe do it for you, some open source tools, some commercial. But in general, if you're going to start talking about multi-agent workflows right now, probably talking some coding or at least something like a no code platform that can help you to uh, construct these workflows. Now, so we're going to look at a couple of these frameworks and we're going to, the one we're looking at today is called Autogen Studio. So let's go ahead and let's take a peek at what Autogen is. It's one of these multi-agent framework. It's from Microsoft. It's pretty new, but they've clearly put a, a, a good investment into this as it's very well done. If you compare it with these really wonderful libraries like Llama Index or Langchain, they have those very broad libraries. They do a lot of different things. And you can also be more granular. You probably get pretty granular with Autogen, but I think one of the things, like when I look at Autogen, I think here's something that's really elegant if I'm really just thinking about multi-agent workflows, whereas when I think about Llama Index or Langchain, and I think about, I can boil the ocean with those things. I can do a lot. How am I going to ingest data? How am I, I can be very granular about how I'm going to do chunking? Be very granular about all different types of tuning. I can create routing implementations for how I do my multi-agent. I can combine all different types of complex graphs and different ways of integrating ecosystem stuff into, into your solution. We could do still the integration with Autogen through uh, function calling. And we'll look at that now. Uh, I've talked enough without pictures, so let me go ahead and... Okay, here we are. So now Autogen. So you can go to microsoft.github.io slash Autogen, or if you just go to Google and you type in the word Autogen and hit enter, you'll find this real quick. They also got, have the GitHub site. This is a open source framework. Now Autogen itself, you know how you normally do this is you're going to go in and write code and you're going to use these libraries and then you're going to make your application. Right? That's how you would typically use... Autogen, right? Just a little bit about the framework itself. Some of the things that this comes with out of the box, these conversable agents, you have this user proxy agent, right? Like if you're gonna have agents talk to each other, when and how would you want them to come back and include you in the loop as a human? So there's this user proxy agent. They have things like this group chat manager, like how do you get bots to talk to each other? Like you can give a bot a tool, you can tell your bot, here's how to use my Discord or my Slack. <laughs> But can, how do you control that? How do you make it manageable and work accordingly to the precise way in which you want it to? Because we're making applications. We need precision. We need to be, have expected behavior that acts exactly how we want. So yeah, assistant agents. And these aren't even all the agents that, that Autogen comes with here. Autogen also has one of the ones that's really cool is the GPT assistant agent. If So this goes into that new assistance API from... Open AI. And there's also some open source solutions if you want to get a equivalent to the assistance API 
but use Llama or some other open source model on the back. That, that's not part of Autogen, right? But, but there are other open source solutions you can find that'll say, here you go, take your Llama, put our open source thing in front of it, and it'll give you an assistance API. Or you can use the actual assistance API. But start to use the assistance API. <clears throat> it is not as simple as calling like a chat completion endpoint because there's there's a lot of different handling that you have to do to to, to code to deal with that. And so one of the frame things they added in here is the DPT assistance API that just makes it super simple to deal with assistance API. So you can have some of your agents as assistants. Frameworks like MIMGPT have integrations into here. So one of the agents could be a MIMGPT agent. Now, and, and, and that's, this is what I've shown so far. It's really cool for those who are comfortable writing code and it's pretty straightforward code. It's all Python. And so pretty straightforward, lots of notebooks, lots of examples. You don't have to figure everything out on your own. You can go find a, a use case that's pretty similar in one of the notebooks they have and, and adjust it to get how you want. But this is not what we're going to look at right now. We're going to look at this Autogen Studio, which is a GUI. It's a web GUI. It's clickable. Here we go. Nice screenshot of our Autogen Studio. Okay. So we can see here in our Autogen Studio, this here is what the, the box with like the green here. This is exactly what the UI looks like. Um, you have a playground. You have something that looks like a chat window. You've got different sessions. They, they have a, each have a, like a UUID or some type of complex ID here, but it's it's the same type of idea that if you use chat DPT, you have these different threads and you can organize your different conversations on, on these different threads and you, you can spin up these different, here we call them sessions, right? And you can spin up and, and tear down different sessions to organize conversations. You can see that like here in this example, they're showing that they're using it to, to request images, right? And that's one of the nice things about these new mixed mode GPT-4 right out of the bag. You can do things like this. Another really cool thing about the Autogen framework is that it can work with tons of LLMs. Now, one thing I don't know yet is if you just jump into this Autogen studio and, and, and haven't spent much time with it yet, all of the different stuff that is possible with Autogen, the framework uh, you might use in, in code and in libraries, I don't see it just pop up inside. There's something like all those different agent types, right? Like I don't see them in the GUI. Now, I don't know though if Maybe there's something that we can do to populate those into the GUI. So we'll explore that. But for but regardless of that, though, I mean, this is just a really powerful way. If you're a coder and you want to write code, you may want to sit there and, and play with all the different settings that you can set for your agent. Maybe you want to play with your prompts and your instructions and your skills. And, and you may want to write code every time you do that. It's, it's nice to be able to just rapidly bootstrap some adjustments and then get your, get your agent's doing exactly what you want. And then you can go from here and and, and uh, since this is all Autogen framework and then start to leverage the agents that you build in here in your code that you use for your applications. But if you're not into code or writing application or maybe you are, but you also like to have productivity application, just this application in and of itself, you don't need to be writing code for this to be useful. I, I have to verify that the GUI version here can work with a variety of large language models, but if it doesn't yet, it will be soon because uh, the Autogen framework itself absolutely does work with, I think, just about any any of the open source large language models that you can bring in, in here. And so you could have a client, maybe you want to save money, maybe you can run like something like Mixtral on your desktop and use this rather than ChatGPT, uh, but other things too. This isn't it's the same. This actually does things that ChatGPT doesn't do. On one hand, this window... And then you may be able to see here right in the middle where my cursor is, it says agent messages, 10 messages, right? Now, where did that come from? So what this is demonstrating is this green box right at the top. That was their question, right? And this text right under where it says agent, the PDF brochure titled coffee brochure. This is the response, right? And then of course the images of the response. We also see some code in the response, right? And maybe how you would generate the images with code. Right? That's pretty cool. And, and, but one of the key things here, agent messages, 10 messages. So what happened here is somebody typed in one question and instead of just trying to answer it, 
the, because this is that agent like approach, the agent can go into a loop and it can reason with itself and it can use tools and skills. And maybe it goes as a web search and then thinks and it makes a plan and then thinks and then does something. And, and uh, you can give it lots and lots of different types of skills to, so that it can do lots of different things. Or you can call APIs or access programs, or maybe if you can, rather than just suggesting a Python code or something like that, you could have things like this actually implement the code, run it, test it, verify if it works or not. Go through a loop to where if it, if it comes up with some code for you and it tests it and it doesn't work before it comes back and, and gives you code that doesn't work and you got to go test it, let it test it and let it try again and let it try as many times as, as, it, as it can to get as far as it can with it before it has to come back and ask you or hopefully it'll say, okay, we had to run through a couple cycles, had to do a couple different tests, but now you've got the code you need, right? So that's the, the whole direction. And so let's go ahead and jump in to, to getting this up and running. It's actually very simple, very quick, very easy to get up and running. I've got a companion blog to this video I wrote uh, yesterday. And so if you just go to artfuel.com, A-R-T-F-E-W-E-L, I'll put the link in the uh, in the description of the video, this will be the top article. And if you'd like to you know, read a little bit more, follow along in text to, to make it a little easier to follow along, um, you can go ahead and check out this blog and all the details are here. Now, one thing you see the title, right? It says Kubernetes and Tanja Kubernetes Grid. You don't need to do any of that. So you might want to do this in your local desktop environment, right? If you're using Python, you'll want to use one of those virtual environments, whether you use Conda or whatever, however you create virtual environments. It's a best practice with Python. Create a virtual environment that way. If you screw something up, you can delete it and, and start a new one and move on. And once you do that, it's just it's one command. Pip install out of Gen Studio. Now, I wrote in the blog here, I normally die inside when I see stuff like this. I see stuff like this all the time. Oh, it's so easy. Then you do it and it doesn't work. And you realize, oh, there was like 19 different versions of 19 different libraries that are used in this stack. And you need to have the specific version for all 19 of those. And hopefully somebody out there will have written a blog or something that says, hey, look, here's a way I got it to work with these exact versions. And then if you, oh, well, then you get it working. But it, it, a lot of times it ends up being way more complicated than it seems. So hopefully since this is a big project and it's you know, got a lot of you know, big backing behind it, it'll keep the, the easier installation tidy. But regardless, I, I'd want to do this in a container anyways, because this is not the only thing that I play with. I dabble with all different types of code projects, open source projects, AI projects, and trying to put all those in one environment is not fun. <laughs> and so you do them in a container. We're going to use a container, the Ubuntu container, because that gives us a pretty consistent starting point. Mm -hmm. So if you use an Ubuntu container and you do the same things, you should end up at the same point. Now, in, a, in the next video or a future video, I want to actually take it to the next level and we'll lock in all the versions and we'll actually build an OCI container that will go put on a container registry like Docker Hub. And then for sure, you got a version that is there that you know is going to work because all of the versions are just locked in and you don't even have to think about it. You just download the container, run it, and you're good to go. This one, we're going to start with the Ubuntu container and then interactively uh, build Autogen Studio uh, inside of a container uh, and then in, in a future video, we'll look at actually creating the container that's ready to go that we can just load up. Please click the link on screen or in the description to see part two of this video where we will build out this solution in the lab. Hope to see you there.